Registered Phenomena Code 849 Object Class Omega Red Hazard Types Aggression Hazard Grouped Hazard Sapient Hazard Teleportation Hazard Containment Protocols As a result of its anomalous properties, RPC-849 cannot be properly contained. Due to the rare occurrence of its manifestations within the general public, it is yet to be considered a major risk to secrecy. To account for the rare event that instances of RPC-849 are caught on camera or recorded by civilians, extensive disinformation campaigns are to be in place by authority-owned media outlets across varied platforms as per the Media Anomalous Disinformation Act of 1939. Such sightings of men in black, as called in popular media, are thus de-emphasized as fabricated hoaxes made or spread by conspiracy theorists online. Personnel and branches within the Authority operating in the fields of temporal displacement are to have read this document and possess a copy of it within their facility in the case of an RPC-849 encounter. Personnel that encounter RPC-849, except for violent encounters, are encouraged to record their conversation with the instances whenever possible. Personnel are to avoid contact with RPC-849-C instances at all costs. Should an encounter with these instances be unavoidable, immediate offensive actions are to be taken towards its neutralization. Research into the activity of RPC-849 across the previous decades is undergoing a joint investigation by different branches of the Authority, in the search of any discernible pattern that could shed light on the goals of RPC-849. RPC-849, colloquially referred to as the Simons by most Authority personnel, is the collective designation for a group of humanoid entities of male appearance ranging from RPC-849-A B, and C. Sightings and visuals recorded by both civilians and Authority personnel report said entities as dressed in formal business attire, usually wearing a bowler hat of some kind. See Recorded Meeting Oshiacom. All instances share similar traits, such as lacking clear facial features, eyebrows, being completely light gray in skin coloration, having a stylized S-shaped pen attached to the left wrist of their suits and talking in singular third person, stating all phrases with variations of Simon Says Said. Simon, now referred to as RPC-849-1, is currently believed to be an actual physical entity, with some degree of agency over the words and actions of RPC-849 instances. RPC-849 instances are almost always seen in groups of two or three, with the exception of RPC-849-C which always manifests as a singular instance. RPC-849 instances possess the primary property of being able to teleport to any location, including an unknown location within baseline reality nicknamed the Headquarters when left unsupervised. See RPC-849-C recording. This has led to several complications in effectively containing and monitoring instances due to current technological limitations. Active research in the more effective containment for interrogation or research via remote supervision is underway in the ProLab Department of Site-055. Ongoing dissection of recovered RPC-849 instances reveals that, despite sharing similar levels of resilience to humans, their bodies do not possess any internal organs. The interior structure of these anomalies is filled entirely with a tar-like substance. Testing on this substance has revealed that, while being made of known elements, the compound itself is not known to occur naturally within Earth outside of specialized laboratories. This has sparked the theory that RPC-849 instances, at least A and B, need to have been created in mass within a laboratory or have their origin be extrasolar in nature. This, alongside their slightly robotic behavior, has led many researchers within the Authority to doubt the self-agency of RPC-849 instances. A popular hypothesis postures that RPC-849 instances act as proxies for RPC-849-1, but a lack of statistically significant data as a result of insufficient containment procedure inhibits further exploration. Possible credence is lent to this hypothesis due to captured instances entering a permanent comatose state upon separation from accompanying instances or the denial of transportation to their base of operations. 
RPC-849 instances, except for RPC-849-C, are commonly docile and will attempt to engage in conversation with any Authority personnel they encounter, often reporting on having known of their arrival or presence beforehand, regardless of what they may happen to be conducting at the moment. However, RPC-849 instances may become violent, utilizing Glock 17mm as their weapon of choice, should personnel attempt to interrupt the current actions of an instance, show aggressive behavior, or at random intervals with no known causation. Reports within the Authority database have shown operations conducted by or involving RPC-849 that would have been otherwise impossible to occur without the direct approval of the country's standing federal government, or at least small sectors of one. No clear evidence for this can be obtained. However, as requests for documents towards said governments, who shall remain unnamed within this document, have repeatedly been denied or ignored. The motives for the actions of RPC-849, such as commonly engaging in communication with Authority personnel involved in the use of temporal or dimension displacement, the kidnapping of seemingly unrelated citizens within North and South America, and the intervention of disjoint events across the decades is still unknown to the Authority. Recently, evidence pointing towards the presence of RPC-849 instances within the Internet have been discovered, although more research is required. RPC-849 A, B, C instances RPC-849 A, the faceless men RPC-849 A are the most common instances of RPC-849 encountered by Authority personnel, either intentionally or unintentionally. The main defining feature of these instances is their complete lack of facial features, such as eyes, nose, or a mouth, while still being capable of actions that would usually require the previously mentioned. They do, however, retain their ears. Most personnel that have encountered these instances have described their face as mask-like in appearance and movement. It is believed that RPC-849-1 utilizes these instances to communicate to organizations or individuals within the anomalous aware sphere of influence, having rarely been described or reported by civilians. These instances, while not completely docile, do not violently react to any type of physical damage or injuries. Their complete lack of any type of personality, alongside their sharp way of acting and speaking, have caused researchers to think RPC-849-A instances are merely proxies used by RPC-849-1 for communication or task-making. RPC-849-B The Fishmen RPC-849-B instances, unlike A, possess full human facial features, although severely distorted in nature, with sunken eyes and cheeks. The ones most often seen by the common population, wherever in public or by the release of classified documents or media depicting them. RPC-849-B instances, while still capable of conversation, are highly more aggressive than A instances, being able to use weapons against targets of interest or planning out assassination attempts on individuals. RPC-849-B instances, over the decades, have gained the attention of the public, often being nicknamed Men in Black, alongside RPC-849-C. This has caused the Authority to run disinformation campaigns over the veracity of these claims and their factual existence, but due to the rise of manifestations during the last years, combined with the increase in the scope of their operations, has caused this endeavor to become highly difficult to achieve. These instances, while sharing the same speech pattern as RPC-849-A, possess distinct personalities from one another, and have been seen making personal commentaries to questions instead of simple sentences. Their actions have also shown a certain level of agency, unlike A instances. RPC-849-C The Exterminator RPC-849-C, often described as an extremely tall humanoid with pale white skin and shadows covering both of his eyes, is the most dangerous of all RPC-849 instances, having entered into violent retaliation with any individual it comes across, authority affiliated or not. During the past years, evidence pointing towards the possibility of RPC-849-C as a sole instance, such as lasting scars and an apparent level of self-agency lacking within A and B instances, have begun to take hold within research personnel. This theory is further affirmed by the apparent capability of this instance for independent thought, 
and its ability to talk in first person, in contrast to the previous ones, as seen on RPC 849C recording. Personnel are advised to avoid contact with RPC 849C if possible, and to enact surprise offensive measures should the former prove impossible. Discovery No exact date of discovery for RPC 849 can be pinpointed. As before former classification, what are now understood to be manifestations of RPC-849 number instances were thought to be non-anomalous events, or in some way related to the anomaly at hand. However, on September 8, 1958, Oshiacom ACI DEP-010 personnel within the region of Indonesia registered an encounter between a cell of the MCP thought to have been utilizing anomalous objects for violent operations against the standing government for the last several years, and a then-unknown entity. This meeting was recorded by equipment hidden within the area as follows. Recorded Meeting Oshiacom. Unknown Meeting Malayan Communist Party Cell Participants Cell Leader Selamat Ben Bujang Five Unknown Cell Members Unknown Entity Forward all dialogue has been translated into English. The following meeting took place within a rural crossroad on the border of Malaysia, Indonesia. Began recording. A convoy carrying a group of six individuals arrives at the settled area at 17.33 pm in accordance with gathered data. From within, the people exiting of the convoy, Bu Zhang can be seen at its front. Bu Zhang stands still in the middle of the field, with its men at both sides. Two minutes later, an unknown entity manifests in the middle of the crossroad, wearing a formal black suit and hat. His facial features, while human-like in appearance, are heavily distorted, such as severely sunken eyes and prominent cheekbones. Bu Zhang raises his index and pinky at the same time as the entity. I salute the One, and I salute you, his messenger. May his word be known by all the people. Simon says it must be known, where the flock is deaf without its prose, and blind without its morning radiance. They are not without his spear soaring across the heavens. Now that that's done with, do you have the settlement? The means? All that he promised for our cooperation? Simon says that which was promised shall be delivered in due time. You must simply wait. He has heard your request. All assets will be given. Assistance will be provided. Forward my appreciation to Simon. I believe this alliance will benefit both of us, should all go as planned. Now as for what the payment is concerned. Bu Zhang retrieves an item from his pocket. The object in question is covered in a red handkerchief and cannot be made out at such distance. Simon says he is pleased by your loyalty. May your knights be shown upon with his radiance. Maybe your shape be hidden within shadows during the early hour by his presence. Farewell. The entity disappears and the group leaves on their convoy. End recording. Additional information. A day after this encounter, the MCP made an attempt on the life of then-Prime Minister Tunku Abdul Rahman during one of his speeches with the use of minor anomalous objects that had mysteriously disappeared from an Authority warehouse a month prior. This, however, was prevented thanks to Authority intervention with local authorities regarding the previous recording. It is yet unknown how this cell of the MCP was able to contact RPC-849, as all members died or took their life during the altercation. Large puddles of tar-like liquids were also found on the scene. Their origin is unknown. Following this encounter, Authority assets from around the globe began to send in files that may relate to the witnessed anomaly at the petition of Oshiacom, which after compilation were transcribed into this document. RPC-849. The aforementioned documents can be found below. Compiled Documents and Manifestations RPC-849 The following documents are not organized in any specific order, and only the most relevant pieces of information will be shown here. For full access to this document, please contact Dr. Marco Gutierrez. Police Interrogation RPC-849 1965 Police Interrogation Case of Supposed Harassment 1965, Portland, Maine Participants Officer Jacob Lederman Mrs. Donovan Forward 
Mrs. Donovan had made several calls during the week to local Portland police officers in regards to the supposed case of harassment, concluding on the deployment of Officer Jacob Lederman into her house after repeated 911 calls. An interview regarding the events follows. Begin recording. Police recording device. Alright, Mrs. Donovan. Could you please state your claim to the police for the record? Um, yes, sure. My name is Margaret Donovan. I live in Portland with my husband, Eric Donovan, and I- The claim, Mrs. Donovan. It would help speed up the whole process if I can have it recorded here. Yes, I- I'm so sorry. I have- or at least I think that I have been followed the past few weeks by a group of men in black suits. They follow me to the park. They follow me when I go buying groceries. They follow me home or when I'm walking the dogs. I just don't feel safe walking in my own neighborhood anymore. I don't even feel safe at home. Alright then. Could you describe said men? Did they look dangerous, or were they doing anything suspicious while following you? Anything that could be helpful for the investigation, ma'am? Well, I don't really know how to describe them. Their eyes were sunken inwards more than what a normal person's eyes should. And they had pretty prominent cheekbones, too. Their black and formal clothing, hat and all, made me think they were government officials. Or maybe friends of Eric. Did you try asking their names? Identities? Some type of documentation or something to verify the assumption? No. They never even approached to talk. And they scattered every time I tried to get close. Just going away until I couldn't see them anymore. I guess they weren't doing anything out of the ordinary while following me. But they were also not doing anything while following me. They just stood still when I did. They moved when I moved. And I never saw them talk between each other. I don't think I saw them blink either. Alright. So a bunch of skeleton looking government clerks were following you around during the week. They all look the same and have not done, according to you, anything that could be described as talking or even blinking. Not counting the fact that they also scatter around like ants when approached. Sounds interesting, I guess. Won't you happen to be under medical prescription, Mrs. Donovan? Any type of antipsychotics, perhaps? I don't like your tone of voice, young man. This is a serious claim. I should go talk to the sheriff myself instead. He knows Eric and may actually help me with this issue, unlike- Mrs. Donovan, please. I'm not insinuating anything at all. I just need to know. I have every detail absolutely clear before coming to a decision. Look, if it makes you feel safer, I can put a patrol to follow you around and stay near your house at night. Sounds good? Yes, it does. Sorry. It's just that I've been feeling very nervous lately. I'm not as young as I used to be, and things like this... They aren't good for my heart. Thank you for listening to my ramblings, Jake. It's my job, Mrs. Donovan. Now you should go to bed and get some sleep. I'll call Mike and Jerry to get in front of the house as soon as I leave. They'll keep an eye on you, and intervene should these hellish clerks follow you again. <laughs> That would be very nice indeed. End recording. Begin recording. Surveillance car, radio conversation. Interference and high-pitched noises can be heard. Working? Hello? Hello? This is Jerry in front of the Donovan's house. Can you hear me? Repeat. This is Jerry in front of the Don- I can hear you just fine, Jerry. It's like 3 a.m. What's the matter? You asked me and Mike to keep an eye on the house, and I think I'm seeing something weird. Maybe one of those guys the old lady was talking about, although I'm not completely sure yet. Scrambling noises can be heard from Lederman's radio. You better not be Justin, Jerry. Tell me what you're seeing. Yeah, so, uh... Mike ended his shift, woke me up to take his place a while while he took a nap, I watched the house for a while, Nothing weird there. Miss Donovan was already sleeping, I think. But, get this. Right when I was about to leave, I turned around. And right there, just at the edge of the streetlight, I saw it. A man in a black suit, just sitting there on a bench, completely still. Later men can be heard placing the radio in between the shoulder and ear, likely to grab a notebook. Alright. 
Tell me all you can about him. How he looks, what he might be doing, everything. Well, he's kind of far away, but I'll do my best. He is wearing a black business suit? That much I know. He is bald. Like, very bald. His head is almost shining from how pale it looks. No hat? None at all. I can't tell from here, but I think he might be wearing some shades. Shades? At three in the morning? Why? I don't know, man. Ask Mike. Some people think they look good, I guess. And as I said, I think they're shades. I just can't make out his eyes. It's all dark around them, so he has to be wearing shades or something. Can you see him holding any weapon? A gun? Anything that could help us know who he is. I can't see anything like that, so... What the hell? What happened? You need me to call Central? No. It's just that. He's... He's gone. Gone how? You were just looking at him moments ago. I have no idea. He was there one moment ago, and now he's gone. He just vanished or something. Vanished? Are you completely sure you weren't looking away while talking to me and lost sight of him? Yes, Jake. I am very sure I didn't mess it up. I don't know. I guess I'll call again if I see anything else comes up. Good night. End recording. Additional information. The day following these recordings, at 14.33 p.m., Mrs. Donovan was found hanging from a noose in the house's master bedroom following repeated failed attempts by Officer Mike and Jerry to contact her. Due to a lack of conflicting evidence of a break-in, the case was considered a suicide, although no clear motive of suicide note could be found within the house. On the other hand, Mr. Donovan never returned home, and his whereabouts are still unknown to this day, as is the identity of the man seen during the previous night. RPC-849-A Encounter Temporal Displacement Temporal Displacement Encounter 1970 Participants Agent Mark Vibar Three RPC-849-A Instances Shortened as E-1, E-2, and E-3 Forward Agent Mark Vibar was part of a test with RPC in regards to the limits of time-displacing properties having sent himself to 1946 within an isolated area of the Arizona desert as to cause the least amount of disturbances. The following is the recovered footage from Bavar's body camera. Begin recording. Following the activation of RPC, Agent Bavar is seen having been displaced towards the desired location, according to the temporal metrics provided by his equipment. As Agent Bavar turns around, he spots what appears to be three faceless humanoid entities in formal attire digging a hole in the ground. Next to one of the instances is a long plastic bag of unknown content. Before he can react, one of the instances spots Agent Bavar, which then alerts the rest of the entities, causing them to cease work and adopt a straight position. Simon said he expected your appearance. He thought, however, that you would have arrived sooner. Agent Bivar, due to the lack of aggressive behavior from the entities, slowly approaches them, ensuring they are fully captured by the camera. Who? Simon says that isn't of interest to you. Instead, he warns you of entering this time uninvited again. We are currently busy. Why am I not allowed in this time period? How did you know I was coming? Who is Simon? Simon said that he still has plans during this time and would prefer to stay undisturbed. Simon said you already came here. There was no need to know. Simon says he is not yet. He will. But for now, he is only a thought, unlike after. What does any of these mean? Who are you people? Simon says that all questions shall be answered within time to come, for now. E2 takes out a small book from his pocket. Simon said you would need this. Before Agent Bavar can answer, he is hit by an unknown entity from behind, falling unconscious, breaking his recording device in the process. 
End recording. Additional information. Agent Vivar woke up approximately three hours later, within a small town in the area's proximity, after which he was able to return to the present time. The reason as to why he was not terminated by the entities is unknown. Following a close inspection of the area depicted in the recording, a tree was found in the location where the entities were originally digging. The skeleton of what was later confirmed to have been a female in her mid-thirties was found six meters underground. The identity of this woman, alongside the reason for her homicide, remains unsolved. The only salvaged item was a pendant holding half a heart. Multiple similar cases, with varying outcomes, have occurred to personnel utilizing temporal displacing anomalies or technology, and are now required to read this document before utilizing them. Additional Manifestations Noteworthy Mentions the following is a list of all presumed manifestations of RPC-849 or actions and events that might have been caused by it. This list is to be constantly updated. 1955 During a speech by former U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, three figures within the crowd were described in a manner that matches the making of RPC-849-B instances. The reason for their appearance within this speech is unknown. 1940 to present day. Civilian reports of RPC 849B instances, alongside C, have become common over the decades, evolving into a type of urban legend to the relief of the Authority. Manifestations do not show any type of correlation with one another, as do the actions performed during them. An investigation into these events is ongoing. 1970 to present day. A symbol commonly known as Cool S or Stussy S began appearing around this time period, sharing an almost one-to-one -one ratio similarity to the symbol worn by all RPC-849 instances. This symbol was quickly adopted into American pop culture and appeared commonly in places such as elementary schools. The reasoning behind the spread, creation, or meaning of said symbol is unknown but has been recently theorized to be a form of cultural conditioning to an image usually associated with RPC-849-1. Unknown date of origin to present day The game known as Simon Says is one of the most recognizable aspects of RPC-849. The origin of these games, much like the Cool S, is unknown, and has caused researchers, due to the common appearance of RPC-849 instances within different time periods, and their awareness of time travel, to believe that the game itself, also much like the Cool S, might have been created by RPC-849 itself as a form of cultural and mental conditioning. Although some argue this theory to be outlandish, thinking that it is the other way around, with RPC-849 having based its language around the game. 1984 During an investigative mission within the AFRICOM region, Authority personnel found what appeared to be a well-dressed man within their travel towards Ethiopia. More exactly, two ASF units and three research personnel traveling within an Authority truck. Before contact could be made, the instance, now considered to be RPC-849-C, opened fire to the truck, killing one ASF unit and injuring three research personnel. Before the remaining ASF unit could react, RPC-849-C had already vanished. The reason for this attack is unknown. 1998 It was made known by Authority assets within New Corp that, a few months prior, a singular RPC-849-A instance had appeared within the New Corp offices with the intent to buy an abandoned observatory under the ownership of New Corp Industries. It is unknown why RPC-849 bought this specific observatory as no signs of usage or restoration within it have yet been seen. 2004 On September 4, 2004, two RPC-849-B instances were caught on camera entering a bank in Brooklyn, New York, in which they retracted the funds from five different bank accounts, amounting to a total of $5 million US dollars. These bank accounts have been made the same day the bank was inaugurated and has been collecting interest ever since. All five accounts were found to have been made under false identities. RPC-849-C Recording RPC-849-C Recording 
Unknown Location, 1988 Forward. The following is a recording interview recovered from a package sent to Site-002. The recording came within a VHS tape titled, Simon Says Stop, being recorded from the POV of Agent Emilio Garcia, standing member of the Protection Division ACI branch, having worked with RPC-849 related cases during the past few years. Agent Garcia had failed to show up to work during the weeks before the delivery of this recording. The location in which this recording took place is still unknown. Begin recording. The camera, apparently attached to Agent Garcia's chest, is currently pointing towards his legs. The floor seems to be made completely out of concrete, and Agent Garcia appears to be tied down by both feet and hands to a metal chair. He is naked and not moving. Steps can be heard coming from the right side of the camera's view. This seems to cause distress in Agent Garcia, who starts shaking around the chair and attempting to scream, being muffled by what can be theorized to be a rope. Good morning, Mr. Garcia. Another beautiful day in the headquarters. How are you doing? The unknown entity enters the frame, revealing it to be RPC-849-C. He brought a chair with him and is sitting in front of Agent Garcia. Well, Mr. Garcia, I think we are ready for our interview, aren't we? Agent Garcia attempts to say something is muffled by the rope. Oh, my apologies. RPC-849-C approaches Agent Garcia, making him shake around his chair as he gets closer. RPC-849-C then takes the rope out of his mouth and throws it off you. Yes, I'm ready. Please. Please, Mr. Garcia. We are all friends here. Now, like we practiced these past few days. Why are you people doing all of this? Interesting question. You may think that we are just doing random things, Mr. Garcia. Nonsensical, even. I couldn't blame you as you do not possess the needed context to understand the reasoning behind them. We haven't given many hints to your people these past decades, either. What would that be? No! No way! RPC-849-C gets up from his chair and begins to punch Agent Garcia on his face and stomach several times. That's not what we practice for! Simon says, say! And what would the context be? Another great question. This is quite the interesting interview we are having, Mr. Garcia. The context is Simon, of course. He knows what needs to happen, and we just follow suit. Like we always have. Like we will always do. Why? Are, are you people doing as he said? You see, Mr. Garcia, we aren't doing what he says. We are doing what he will say. If you understand me, he… I… I… You are not meant to respond to a rhetorical question! Agent Garcia looks down while trembling and breathing heavily. As I was saying, he is not he yet. He is not here yet, but he will, and he wants to make sure of it. Now you say… He, he isn't here, and he yet… Always so inquisitive, Mr. Garcia. No wonder they put you to work studying us. <laughs> he has not come yet this time, but he has in the past. The sage with fountains at his shoulders, the accursed one, he who fell from the sky like a bleeding star, he who shattered the heavens with a spear, he who burned the great city and all those holy. So many things, Mr. Garcia, so many things, some of which you may worship already, although some details are better left in the dark. Agent Garcia remains unresponsive. Is something wrong, Mr. Garcia? Did you forget your line? What 
what are you? What are the, the people we've we've seen all these years? Very good. You see, we weren't always the men of Simon. You could say we were all were borrowed from another place, from another time, from another thing. And so we've remained. And the things we do, we do them because we have to do them. I'm only slightly different, but one and the same nonetheless, now. Why? Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Why are you doing this to innocent people? Why, why are you doing this to me? What is it you want? What are you trying? Oh, Mr. Garcia, we were doing so well. RPC-849C grabs his chair and sits directly in front of Agent Garcia. He begins touching his face, causing Garcia to tremble. I thought we got to understand each other these days, Mr. Garcia. Innocence is not an important factor in the big scheme of things, you see. Everyone has a part to do in this play, as do you. Please, please, no. Please just let me go. I swear, I'll never look into your people ever again. And please, please, I'll do it. I'm sorry. I can't do that, Mr. Garcia. I brought you here to do your part in this play. To send a message. Stop bothering us. Your people cannot keep everything contained, Mr. Garcia. This world. This poor world. It is far too chaotic for that to be doable anymore. Maybe there was a day where this was all possible to be kept hidden, but that time is far gone now. I'm very sorry that it must end this way, Mr. Garcia. I only ask for your understanding. RPC-849-C looks directly into the camera. Look for the Star of Bethlehem, and you will know we mean true. Now, it's time to say goodbye, Mr. Garcia. End recording. Additional information. Following the delivery of this recording, research into the identity and proper classification of RPC-849-1 began with the data collected from RPC-849-C's commentaries. It should be noted that in December of the same year, an astronomical event regarding the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn to Earth, commonly believed to have been the origin of the Star of Bethlehem, occurred. No records of birth from any individual named Simon nor abnormal events were able to be collected during this period. The whereabouts of Agent Garcia and his fate are still unknown to this day. Urgent Update RPC-849-1 Possible Manifestation A Child's Game Gone Too Far Lucius Lederman, TEDx California 2020 Forward. The following is a TEDx talk performed by Lucius Lederman, a world-renowned humanist and computational engineer within Silicon Valley. The topics of this talk are about the effects religion has had on humanity over the millennia, and his thoughts after studying theology for over four years as a side project. The video in question is currently available on different websites, most notably YouTube and TED's official website. As of the time of writing, it has garnered approximately 20 million views. Starting video. The common TEDx logo rolls on screen, before showing Lederman on stage, saluting the crowd as they cheer him. A large moving earth can be seen on the screen behind him. Hello, beautiful people of California. I am Lucius Lederman, and it is a great pleasure to see you all here today to see me talk, or well, it's more like rambling than anything else. The crowd can be heard laughing and cheering. Lucius Lederman had become, in the past decade, one of the most notorious figures within California, using developments in the field of green science to better the life of small towns within the state, with some political associations even having requested him to run as governor during the last elections. Now, I welcome you to my speech about religion, or as I like to call it now, the longest-running game of Simon Says, and yes, a religion talk coming from the atheist humanitarian. Who would have guessed? Now, you may be thinking, how do those two things relate to one another? And you wouldn't be to blame, as you do not possess the needed context to understand the reasoning behind what I just said. 
Sometimes I think neither do I. Now, if you'll so allow me, I will provide said needed context. First, I would like to mention that this is not simply the take from some big nerd up there in Silicon Valley. I have taken the good part of these past five years to study, comprehend, and analyze religion. All religion, for that matter. While, of course, focusing mainly on the Abrahamic ones. But I have still done my fair bit of studying, just so that no folk can claim that I'm speaking out of my metaphorical ass. Now, haven't you ever taken a moment to sit down and think of all the rules that religion has placed upon men? Like sat down and thought really hard for a while? Because that's what I've been doing those past few years. As stated previously, and at one point you realize that it can all be boiled down to two simple words. Simon says. Simon says don't eat pork. Simon says don't eat meat on a certain day, although fish is completely fine for some reason. Simon says love your parents. If they love you back, that's not my problem. And you start seeing a repeating pattern. It's all rules made by men, with some unseen entity to back them up but made by men nonetheless. And why for? Control. Whether it be political or ideological, it's always about control. And yes, this is a very hot take coming from a libertarian, I know, and religion doesn't always need to take the form of a god. It can be the state. It can be the law. It can be your parents when you are five years old even. And one may think that all these things are good that they keep people in check from being naughty, but my studies suggest otherwise. In 1958, a group of political extremists, following the rules of some satanic cult as documents have shown, attempted an attack on the life of the Malaysian Prime Minister. It was technically within their rules to do so, but weren't those supposed to keep people in check? You may tell me this is cherry-picking, so let's move on to a more wide example. My dad, Jacob Lederman, blessed be his soul up in California on an old man's resort, he used to be a man of the law, the law that, supposedly, kept people in check. Until one fateful day in the mid-sixties, a woman he promised to keep safe died under mysterious circumstances, hanged over her own bed after asking my father to keep her safe from men that followed her around. He tried and tried to get the town sheriff to look into the case that it could not go unnoticed, but his pleas fell on deaf ears, much like the ones from the faithful often do, and so he left his life as a cop, forever. Now comes my mother, happy life, a kid, a husband, everything is okay for his God-fearing lady, until one day she is gone, nowhere to be found, simply banished. We tried looking for her, we tried praying, but just like all those years ago, his pleas, and mine, fell into even deafer ears. I still hold the pen that she gave me for my tenth birthday, half a heart, to remind me of what I… I'm still missing, sorry. Lederman's eyes begin to tear up. He grabs a napkin and wipes them. And I ask, where are the gods when you need them? Where are the logos of order? Where is the force that should keep the world in check? And that, ladies and gentlemen is what I and my dear friend Octavio is set up to change. A tall, bald man with shades and a walking cane, of the type usually worn by those visually impaired, enters the stage. This right here is one of the greatest men on this planet, my technically second father, and a victim of God's playbox. He used to be what I guess one may call a pagan, although now he just considers himself a normal person. One day. His rules conflicted with some other people's rules, and acid went flying, mainly into his eyes. My father met him shortly after retiring from the force, and he has acted as my uncle ever since, and as my guide. And today, we would like to present the solution to this grand problem. I present you all the Simon Charity Foundation. The image on the screen behind Lederman changes to a logo featuring a Stussy S as its main keypoint. The logo slowly morphs into a hand made out of said letters, with both its index and pinky fingers raised. What we seek out to do with this charity is help people, actually help them, 
actually listen to their pleas and sorrows. Anything from financial aid with criminal cases, medical bills, anything you can imagine. We are here to finally help the people, unlike everyone who has come before us. As for the name, it's simply a play on the topic previously stated, and, of course, my mother's last name, Simona, for when she couldn't be there to help me. Now she will be there to help others. Operations will begin December, so be ready, because we are here to help. The crowd stands up to applaud and cheer. Leadermen can be seen bowing. Video finished. Closing Statement Yes, you've seen what I've just seen, and are likely as perplexed as I am. We cannot delete the video without causing mass confusion within the public. We have tried contacting the government for help, but we have gotten only radio silence. We are still working on ways to prevent any type of dangerous consequence this charity foundation might bring, and we are all crossing our fingers, hoping that what just happened is simply a horrible, horrible coincidence. But some sentences just match one-to-one -one ratio words said by those things in the past, and we cannot do anything. Our hands are as tight as they can be, and we only have hope left. Dr. Marco Gutierrez